in this particular case, it's not as if I found the idea. It's that the idea found me. Speaking of paths not taken, you said you were in the middle of another book when the topic yeah. of regret came up. Yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit more about, because if you think about the way we think about that at the D school or in the kind of innovation land is you've got an innovation funnel. You got a lot of ideas that you don't do much with, some that you do a little bit with, some that you do more and some that you implement and succeed, right? Um, or there's probably implement and then succeed is less. Um, <clears throat> but I'd be Tell curious it, yeah. how, how you think about funnel management, so to speak, meaning you had something in the hopper how did you remain attuned and aware to other things even while you're in the middle of a project? And at what point did you decide this other thing is better? And then, you know, kind of postscript, what happened to that? Is that still in the hopper? Did you discard it entirely? Would love to hear about that. Okay, so on the on the second part of the question, yeah, it's, it is still in the hopper. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't, um, it was, it's not extinguished. I just put it, um, you know, on the, on the back burner. Uh, in terms of like, so, so I'm happy to talk more about this idea of of the funnel, because I think it's actually super important. Um, but on this particular on this particular case, I think it was because um, I mean, this is going to sound I, I don't mean this to sound as glib as it uh, the, I, the, the sentence formed in my head. And then when I was reading it in my head, I was like, oh, my God, this is going to sound like total bullshit glibness. But but it really oh, I love it. Tell it us honestly, it honestly is not. But I mean, or at least I don't think it, it is. You can interpret it that way if you want, is that in this particular case, it's not as if I found the idea. It's that the idea found me, that that I wasn't looking for it, and it just sort of captured me, and and wouldn't let go, and and I think that and, and that that doesn't happen all that often. Most cases, for me at least, you have ideas, and they're like, eh, okay, that's pretty good. Eh, that's that's awesome. That's pretty good. You know, um, and you have a lot of stuff. Eh, it's pretty good. And then you can stress test that and decide whether that thing that's really good is actually kind of weak or it's actually, well, it is really good, all right? Mm -hmm. But this one came at it, this one, this one approached me in a, in a, in a, different, in a different way. Um, it, um, it sort of grabbed hold of me. And so, and when that happens, and I think it's relatively rare, at least it's rare for me, I guess you have two options. You can say, get your grimy hands off of me, you know, and throw it and, and throw it aside uh, because I've got something else that I'm do working on. Um, and but there, but or you can say, wait a second, like the fact that this idea is gripping me is telling me something. And maybe this grip that is being exercised by this particular idea is more ferocious than the idea that I'm working on now. Um, which I actually can stop thinking about. Mm. Um, and mm. so I, the question is really, sir, how do you respond to that? I think in some cases, the, the grip is, could be misleadingly strong, yeah. but at least for me, it was strong enough that I explored. Now, let me say one other thing here, because um, I, um, I do wanna, I, want, I, I think it goes to the creative process here thing. As I explained, once this idea had a grip, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to write a book about regret. Right. I did two things. Number one is that I looked at the existing research. Is there a there there? Is this interesting? Do I want to do I want to spend time looking at this? Does this say something novel, fresh, useful that people could, you know, that could benefit people's lives? The second thing that I did, which I mentioned, is that I didn't say I didn't call up my editor and say, hey, Jake, I want to write a book about regret. I wrote an entirely new book proposal. Now, the reason I did that is not because I am a conscientious and hardworking fellow. The reason I did that <laughs> is that when, for me at least, I always write a book proposal. I always write a book proposal and my book proposals are actually fairly long, 25, 30 pages. I don't, you know, it's possible. I mean, listen, I can come up with a one paragraph idea when I go out for a walk this afternoon, all right? But, uh, but, that's, but that's, that's can be very vaporous. With a book proposal, I have to see if there's a there there. I have to say, if I can't get 25 pages out of it, how am I gonna get 325 pages out of it? What's more, it's a test of my own interest in it. If I say, oh my God, 
I, I've written book proposals before and I've gotten to the end of it and I said, oh, this is not a book. Or it's like, this is a book, but it ain't one that I'm gonna write because I don't wanna spend two or three years in the rest of my life thinking about this. And so, and so that is how, so I basically responded to the grip, which is tighter than I had experienced, but I use that as the start, not the end of the process. Well, and there's one other thing that you mentioned, which I was, I was thinking that you were going to say when you said proposal, but you didn't, but you said you talk to people. You, you said, oh. you said, furthermore, everybody wanted to talk about it. And I wonder if you could share, yeah. I was talking with a, a wildly uh, innovative entrepreneur yesterday who's trying to build a chocolate empire, which maybe we'll have them on someday. They're really cool. They're called Midday Sports. I would love to see an interview with Willy Wonka, definitely. Oh, oh well, I'm trying to get him. I've been trying to get him. Uh, the, but, but they said something interesting. They said anytime they got to write a board you know, update or something like that, they said, quote, creativity isn't within you, it's outside of you. Huh. And the question is, where do you go? Not what do I have? And there was something there, and for me, uh, not to answer the question for you, but yeah. where do you go? It sounds like you go to conversation, even maybe before or in parallel to a pros proposal, but I'd love to hear how you think about that. How, you know, when it's got a grip on you, how do I know, am I weird or is this profound? It's a great question, Jeremy. And, and, um, and I just wanna say that if, they, if the questions are, Am I weird or is this profound? Those are not mutually exclusive. All right. So just <laughs> Touché. One, yeah. So in fact, and sometimes there's a harmony between those um, be between That's those great. two. So um, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my general. I'll tell you my general approach. Um, and then in, in this particular case, is that um, I, you know, if if I have a pro if I have a process, and I don't want to I don't want to overstate that I have some kind of sophisticated process is that what I think that you do is that is that I in terms of ideas is like I gather a whole bunch of stuff. All right. So so or not, not even that I basically generate a lot. Now, this is a, this is this is a cliche, but it happens to be true is that the only way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. I'm convinced of that. I, mean, I think that the D school, you know, that, that might be the D school motto in in Latin somewhere on its crest. Right. It is. But, but, it I, is. but I think that is empirically. I think that is empirically true. It's right next to the no regrets tattoo is the <laughs> have a lot of ideas. So when I think about it, I think about just generating and gathering a whole bunch of stuff. And then I think about um, then I think about evaluating these, uh, uh, you know, then, then I then I and, 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 and in the process of evaluating these things, uh, what I will all what I will often do is I will um, I mean, this is a, a 50 cent word, but it's a word that I like to use. I, I will socialize the ideas. Yeah. That is, I will put them out there in some way. Um, and I think that there is a, a usually misplaced fear that someone is going to quote unquote, steal your idea. And I think that's generally misplaced. I mean, again, I respect intellectual property and trade secrets and all that, but I just feel like that, that in some way we're a little bit over indexed on our fear. We're sort of over indexed on our fear of people stealing our ideas and under index on the value of socializing our ideas. Mm. And so if I put something out there and I get a response of like, just boredom, that, that's telling me something. Again, it's not determinative. Um, if I get a response saying, hey, that's interesting, that's an in that's okay response. If I get a response saying, that's interesting, have you ever thought about blah, 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 blah? That's a better response. If I get a response saying, what are you talking about? That can't be right. That's very interesting. Mm. And so, and so what I, you know, or, or if I, the response that I really, the response that I, that I really take seriously is you put an idea out there and people say, and people then respond with a story about that, in which they locate themselves in that set of ideas where they say, Hey, you know what? Something happened to me like that. Yeah. And I didn't, I never really understood it until you put it that way. You know, um, and so um, and so so you look for you look for you look for that. Um, the the worst thing is is when you get just kind of a blah reaction. You know, oh that's interesting. Yeah, okay, cool, that's interesting. You know, um, again, those aren't determinative, Jeremy, but but it's another it's another point of data. I, I like to do it in conversation because it's real time. But I have done things like um, um, I had this one idea. I'll give you an example. I had this one idea uh, where I put it in my email newsletter. 
And then I heard from a magazine editor. And I was like, this is pretty good. You know, I thought it was a pretty good idea, but let me see how people respond to it. And I put it in my newsletter. And then amazingly, it's like, um, I heard from a magazine editor saying, hey, this is a really cool idea, Dan. Can you write a piece for us about this? And I'm like, oh yeah, I'm on it. And then I wrote a piece about it. And then I was like, okay, this piece is gonna go wild. And it didn't because I that's your fault. That's your fault. <laughs> no, but I think it's I think it's the nature of the idea itself. I think the idea was an article and an article can be a good idea, but it's not necessarily something that's going to rattle around in people's heads and hearts for years and years and years and years and years. And, years. Right. and so that, you know, that that kind. So. OK, so I, yeah. as you might not be surprised to hear, I now have a thousand more questions, but I'll rattle a few off and then you just you take it where you want. Yeah. Um, you said you generate a ton of material. Yeah. And I'd love to know, how do you define it? You know, Linus Pauling, when he says have a good idea, you need to have a lot of ideas. I I, ha I happen to have a definition of that, but I'd love to know what that is. What's your definition of that? 2,000. 2,000 ideas. You need 2,000 ideas to get one good idea. That's good. That's a that's a that's a healthy ratio. I don't I don't think I'm quite there, but I don't know if I've ever had a good idea. So maybe I need to nah, generate a few more. Well, what I mean, that was from that's actually from our friend Bob Sutton, who's a researcher at Stanford, but he studied IDEO's toy lab and found that it took they had a log of about 4000 ideas to get to a couple of commercial successes. But the yeah. thing that's fascinating is, as I started just as a nerdy aside for a moment, as I started looking into it, I realized, you know what, that same ratio holds in pharmaceutical discovery. It holds, you know, James Dyson made 5,000 prototypes of the bagless vacuum. Uh, the Taco Bell Food Lab, the, the person who runs that said recently that she tested 2,000 versions of the Doritos Locos Taco before they got it right. Yeah. Um, Saturday Night Live, I mean, on and on and on and on, right? Like you kind of see this this ratio out there. But so, but to me, one question what, for you is, what does it look like to generate? How do you capture a set of, yeah. and then the second part of it is, so if socializing is kind of the first step in the validation process, how do you keep track of your socialization efforts? Do you have different channels? Are you socializing multiple ideas at once? Um, I'd love to hear about that because to me, there's when you're dealing with a volume of ideas, the question becomes, how do I keep track of this stuff? Yeah, so so lots of questions and very, very interesting ones. So, so I think part of it ends up being, um, you know, at some level, what constant, I have to say, I, I, I don't know whether there's a golden ratio, whether that golden, there's a golden ratio of 2000, 2000 to one. Um, I think that it is, you know, arguably a lot, the ratio is a lot to one and right. a lot more than people think to one. Exactly. Um, exactly. So I think that that's probably the, I, my hunch is that that's probably the golden ratio. I also think like, let's go back to your, um, your Taco Bell example. It depends on like what really constitutes an idea. Um, so, you know, 2000 versions of that, what, whatever that is, um, the Doritos Locos taco. I mean, it could be, it's like, I mean, one idea could be, oh, we're going to have a taco that has right angles rather than curves. Right. Okay. I mean, we can debate whether that actually constitutes that constitutes an idea, I, but I do well, think it's, a, I do think I it's important. Say, I would say quality, actually, that's part of the challenge is people, you know, like I, I'll tell you this, Dan. And wherever I am, you know, interacting with a group, people say, what do you do? I say, I help people come up with ideas. There's always the same universal response. Doesn't matter where you are. You know what it is? How do you come up with a good idea? I go, well, I didn't say anything about good. Why did you yeah, say yeah, that? Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, and to yeah, me, yeah. like, you're kind of, yeah. that's like, you're, that's the exception that proves the rule. The fact yeah. that when you start qualifying what counts as an idea shows how deeply the cognitive biases are, right? right? Because then we go, oh, well, now it's only good ideas that matter. I mean, I was talking to a guy the other day. I was trying to get a, a group of students to generate 20 ideas a day. And I asked students, most people did a good job. One of them goes, I only had three. I go, Tony, what happened? You had the assignment was 20. He goes, no, I mean, three good ideas. I said, Tony, count the bad ideas, right? But it's just so deeply ingrained that we only want to count the good stuff. We don't see yeah. it's actually sometimes the bad stuff that leads to the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's and and it's and it's 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 complicated. I mean, in that in that you, you know, you need bad ideas, but you also need to be able to discard those bad ideas, and move past them. That's also, you know, that that's also, and you need to be able to distinguish between what's good and what's good and what's not good. In terms of, and, and now, Jeremy, I've sort of lost the thread of the question. So you you wanted to know about? Um, well, we I would say let's keep moving forward. So yeah. you can do a proposal. 
how many as as kind of an early stage uh, experiment? And you said you do that often. Define often. How many people oh, no, writing? Oh, I mean, I first of all, I, I've I, not that. I mean, I've, so let's say I've written seven books, which means that I've written seven proposals for those books, sure, and sure. then I've probably written another seven that never that I put a spike in. Okay. But I mean, but but that's but if you think about seven, that's that's a seven of those. That's that's a you know 180 pages right there. Yeah, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And how do you like one thing I, I saw in an interview that you did with a hero of mine, Stephen Johnson. You said every day you sit down, you try to write a certain number of words. Yeah, what, on writing days, absolutely, I do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and the reason I do that is just because I mean, I think it's true for many creative processes, but I think it's absolutely true for writing is that it's much more about um, you. You can't sit around waiting for inspiration. You just have to show up and do your fucking job. Yeah. That's that's my approach to it. Yeah. Um, and you know, if I sat around this office and waited until I was inspired to write, I I would I would spend I would have spent years watching ESPN highlights and, doing, <laughs> and accomplishing very little. You know, uh, well, you know who you reminded me of when you said that. I, I, it was Jerry Seinfeld. You know, he's yeah. he's mentioned many times. He he uses the analogy of a of a trainer an exercise. He says like, do you put in your work? Absolutely. He said, you know, every day he gets the yellow legal pad and he puts yep. his work in. Yep. But to me, the thing that's interesting about Seinfeld, and, and I would love to understand this from your process. I don't know. Have you seen the comedian the the HBO special about Seinfeld? It is it's, one of my very favorite movies. Okay, we are then we're soulmates because I yeah. can watch it. On, it's you know, fantastic. On it's so, fantastic. I recommend it to everybody here. Yes. So every yeah, please. That's like that's MOC homework. Everyone watch the comedian. What I wanted to reference Dan is Jerry has this practice of in the morning he takes out his legal pad. He reviews what he wrote yesterday he, and then he writes new material. But then here's the thing: he goes to the club at night and he tests it and he crosses stuff out. I would love to know, you know, if you have that daily, call it 500, whatever the quota is, do you have a nightclub? No. And if so, like, how, how do you start to refine the material that you're creating every day? Yeah, I don't have a nightclub and it's a, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting idea. I will um, occasionally email stuff to people. Um, I will, um, you know, my wife is, is the, the only other employee of Daniel Pink Incorporated. And so she sees everything uh, multiple times. Um, um, and, but, but I don't, but I don't do that in the systematic way that I don't do that in the systematic way that Seinfeld does it. Um, perhaps I'm wrong, but, um, I feel like at some level I might be a better audience than a performer that as I think that one, one of, one of that, that, that as I reflect on my abilities, and I think that's also very important for people to do, like, like, what are you like, you think about what are you good at? And the, the first answer has to be not much. Most people are not on most things. People are not good at them. I am not good at most things. And so I think it's figuring out what are you good at? And I think one of the things I'm reasonably good at is I feel maybe I'm wrong. I feel like I have pretty good taste. I feel like I have pretty good taste into what's interesting and what's provocative and what's meaningful and what's BS. Um, and I trust my taste a lot. Now, I, I, maybe that's probably more so today than 20 years ago. Um, and so, um, and so I will, and so, so, but among the, let me, do, let me be more specific, among the programmatic things that I will do, sometimes what I will do is I, okay, I'll give you an example. So I'm actually working on a, I'm working on a speech I, I'm, the reason I'm pointing is that I have a computer right over here. I mean, if you want to, if you want to fact we, check, we me. can we can imagine it. Yeah, we okay, can imagine. all right. Um, <laughs> and um, and I have a speech right there that I'm that I'm working on. It's it's something where I have to do an event that is actually requires like, it's a more formal kind of thing. It's like you're you're at a podium and you you actually have to you know do that the kind of thing. It's a more formal university kind of thing, and um, and so I'm writing that. But what I did uh, earlier today when I knocked in when I got in my words is. I recorded it on my phone. I don't know why I'm, I, I feel the need to prove that I have a computer and a phone, but you get yeah, the idea. Show us, show I, us. I, really? I, I recorded it, I recorded it, I recorded like the intro on my phone, at reading it in, and then I listened to it, and I listened to it a couple of times. So I put myself uh, in the nightclub in that way. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard, 
I've just as an aside on this point, I've heard Walter Isaacson say that he'll, he writes at night and the first thing he does, he prints out whatever he writes and he reads it first thing in the morning. And that's kind of just, you know, new, new glasses, so to speak. Yeah. Another thing that, another thing that I do is, um, uh, again, with my wife as a partner is, um, like for, 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 for every book that I've written, but let's take the latest book. Um, I read every single page, not of every draft, but of many drafts out loud to her. Wow. What's more, she read every single page, not of all drafts, but of most drafts out loud to me. So, and what does so, that do for you? What, like why spend the time doing that? Because when you hear it, it's different. When you hear it, it's different. I mean, I don't have a better, more articulate way of explaining that, Jeremy, but trust me in my gut, when you hear it, it's different. That doesn't sound right. Wow, that was way too many words to explain that idea. And you wouldn't, it's just another form of processing that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't see. I, I think it's important wow. to change the, the mode of processing. I'll give you something even smaller that I do. I, I, I print out stuff and read it just silently. But what I will also do in the course of most things is I will change the font because I don't want to get into the groove of saying, okay, I've seen this before. I know where it's coming next. I'll change the font. I might change the size so that the page breaks are different so that it, the sentence breaks are different so that I have to bring a fresher eye to it. That's, I love that. It's like tricking yourself in a sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But it's more like, again, I hadn't thought about it in precisely the way that you're describing, but if you go back to, to Seinfeld, it's like, you know, I am essentially playing the audience. Mm. Right, right. And you're giving, in a way, what I see there is you're giving yourself a little bit, you're, you're finding ways to grant yourself objectivity or to distance yourself from the work. Yeah, it's distancing more than objectivity, I think, because I don't think I could ever be perfectly objective. Sure. But it allows me to basically be, it's, it's a form of surrogation in a way where I'm kind of being the, being the audience. So. Mm -hmm.